You're listening to an audio resource from Redemption Hill Church. This resource is not meant to be a replacement for participation at a local church, but an accessory to the care you're receiving from your own pastors. To learn more about Redemption Hill Church or to give to our ministry, visit redemptionhilldsm.org. I will be reading from Romans uh, chapter uh, 12, verses 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks for standing for the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Redemptional Church. Good to sing with you. Um, as you can tell, if you're a member, a regular tender, we've structured the service a little bit differently. If you uh, get the email that I send out before Sunday celebration, uh, you probably saw that, hey, there's not four songs, there's only two. Uh, that's to accommodate our family meeting afterwards. Uh, because we meet at this particular elementary s- uh, school, there's some time restraints, so we've got to kind of work within those, those parameters. So just so you know a little bit what's, what's going on. Uh, we do have our kids' sermon notes, so kids, if that serves you, you can bring, up, then bring them up afterwards, and then you can pick something out of, I think it's been replenished. Did Mr. Danny do it? He sure did. All right, good news. Also, uh, there's totes in the hallway, and uh, kids get restless, that's cool. We have a restless kids' room over there where we pump in the audio, so if that serves you, you can use that as well. Kids, as I am accustomed to saying, you're not a distraction. You're not a distraction. You are indeed a blessing. All right, today I am wrapping up a short sermon series called All of Christ. Uh, As a reminder, the purpose of our sermon series has been to remind ourselves of why Redemption Hill exists. Why do we exist? Uh, Next week, I anticipate getting back into the Sermon on the Mount and kind of getting back into the Lord's Prayer and just kind of continuing on in that particular sermon series. But we took a pause of that so we could focus on why we exist leading up to our family meeting. Uh, We have, like I said, intentionally condensed our our service to make all those accommodations. And I realize some kids have naps and things like that. So my goal is to get you out, um, you know, get get shut down and out around noon, 1215. So let me pray and then we get into today's message, as you can tell, it's from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I need God's help. So you would join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It is good, it is instructive, it is inerrant. It, it, as we see this morning, it shows us why we exist. That's what John just prayed as well. We exist for worship. So help us to see from your word by the power of the Spirit. A um, more clear picture of why we're here. Help me to be faithful to your word and what you've already spoken. I desperately need your help, O oh God pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So what is worship, right? We use the word a lot. Uh, We come to church and we call it worship. But what what is worship? Think about what you give your time and energy to, right? Uh, I'm not talking about necessarily vices. Let's just talk about good things for a moment. Things you give your time and energy. A, A marathon runner spends a lot of time training, right? There's a lot of dedication to be a marathon runner. An artist, my dad's an artist, as some of you know, he would labor for hours and hours and hours, specifically at night when he wasn't working. I don't even know if that guy slept sometimes, just to get the right color on the canvas. Like, that was dedication. Uh, A pastor, myself, uh, spends a lot of energy and time into preparing a sermon, preaching, obviously, pastoral ministry more generally. Now, here's the question I want to ask. Is it possible for good things in life to be worshipped? Is it possible that a good thing you love is given a higher priority than your creator? In my previous three sermons, the last three Sundays, I've attempted to redirect our gaze upon Jesus Christ. From Colossians 3, I tried to show you That Christ is your all in all. All that you can do, Christian, 
All that you do is in service to King Jesus. Everyone serves somebody. I've got Bob Dylan in my head. You've got to serve somebody. Everybody serves somebody. And there are times when we need to be reminded that at the end of the day, ultimately, Christians are in service to Christ. He is indeed our all in all. Uh, therefore, we need to earnestly desire all of Christ in our lives. After Colossians 3, we looked at Deuteronomy 6. In Deuteronomy 6, we see that we are to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our might. Of course, that gets repeated in the New Testament by our Lord Jesus Christ. You can go to the Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Matthew for that. And as you serve God with all of your heart, soul, and might, we are to see from Deuteronomy 6 that we're actually to leave a Christian legacy, right? We're passing things down from one, from one generation to the next. In particular, we are instructed by Holy Scripture to instruct our children with the teachings and the commandments of God. The Christian faith is not a theory or some intellectual exercise, but it actually has implications upon your life for how you live your life. So all of Christ for all of life, all of your life. Now, last Sunday, I, I, I hoped and I think I pushed the ball down the court a little further. And the idea is that in the province of God, you and I live in a specific time. We live in a particular area, the Des Moines Metro. God has placed us in a time and place with a purpose. From Genesis 12, we see that when God told Abram that his offspring, offspring would bless the nations, well, if you are a Christian, you are part of Abram's offspring, Abraham's offspring. You are called to bless the nations right around you. We certainly can begin in the home, and then we can go to your workplace. We can go to your neighborhood. Wherever God has placed you, you are to be a blessing. Everything um, I've been teaching is, I think, part of, the, part of the foundation of this local church. We want to be a local church that exists for Christ. We want to be a local church that exists for Christ the next 20 years from now or 200 years from now, if the Lord tarries. Like, we're being really honest, it's a very specific goal. We don't exist for ourselves, we exist for Christ and Christ alone. It's why we we're here. It's why we planted four years ago. We want to be a church that understands that we exist in a time and place, and we are called to proclaim the gospel to the Des Moines Metro, and we are to live Christ-shaped lives in this area. Now, if God were, were to move you to a different location, guess what? You, pro you proclaim the gospel there, and you live a Christ-shaped life there. All of Christ for all of life, for all of the Des Moines Metro, is how we worship. Worship is not relegated to Sunday mornings. The worship of God is not only singing songs. Worship is how you live. You worship God by the little decisions that you make every single day. You worship God when you sacrifice for the sake of someone else. You worship God when you're parenting or when you're at work. You worship God in the car. You worship God at the grocery store. As a matter of fact, as John indicated in his prayer rightly, man and woman were created by God for worship. You were created to worship. Instinctively, we orientate the heart to worship something or someone. The question on the table since Genesis 3, who or what are you worshiping? Let's take a, just a cursory look um, at the culture around us for evidence of worship. My Iowa Hawkeyes play at Kinnick Stadium in Iowa City, and that stadium holds 70,000 people, right? So, so, a lot of towns in Iowa aren't that big. 70,000. My question is this. How many of the 70,000 are engaging in worship? 
I love the Hawkeyes. I was, I was watching the TV last night. Watching the Hawkeyes actually win a game. Iowa State Cyclones, just because half of y'all, maybe three-fourths of y'all, might be Cyclones fans. 61,500 people at Jack Trice Stadium. Up there names. How many of those fans are engaged in worship? Listen, I really enjoy college football. I know what I'm saying. I know that in some degree, I'm pointing the finger back in on myself. But I think we can admit that these stadiums can be treated as modern-day temples and churches. But you don't need to go to a game to engage in worship. Worship can take place on the couch in front of the TV. So the thing is, how often do we take something that is good and enjoyable and turn that good thing into an object of worship. Here's the potential litmus test to see if you are engaging in ungodly worship. If God is calling you to do A, and you can't stop doing B to do A, it is likely that B is the true object of your worship. If God is saying, hey, I need you over here, we read clearly in God's word, we're supposed to do this or not do this, and you can't obey, obey your Lord, perhaps we got some idolatry going on. You are worshiping an idol. So you all know the phrase, all of Christ for all of life, for all the Des Moines That phrase is meaningless if we're not living to worship God. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, is an excellent passage to use to evaluate the heart and perhaps redirect the heart when it comes to worship. So for the next several minutes, I want to show you from Romans 12 why we worship, how we worship, and the goal of worship. Why, how, and then the goal. Here's why we worship. We read in the first half of verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God. When you initially read this verse, you might ask, what does this say about the why of worship? It actually tells us quite a lot. The answer is found in the word, therefore. As the saying goes, when you read the word, therefore, you need to look back to see what comes before. In Romans chapter 1 through Romans chapter 11, the Apostle Paul tells us about the mercy, grace, and love of God through Jesus Christ. That's Romans 1 through 11. The book of Romans is a masterful piece of literature explaining how a sinful person can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. I found this quote very helpful from from John Stott. He says, For 11 chapters, Paul has been unfolding the mercies of God. Indeed, the gospel is precisely God's mercy to inexcusable and undeserving sinners in giving his son to die for them and justifying them freely by faith and sending them his life-giving spirit and in making them his children. In particular, stop goes on. The key word of Romans 9 to 11 is mercy. For salvation depends not on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. And his purpose is to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy. The book of Romans lays down the gauntlet. It says that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Now, allow me to demonstrate why we worship. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have heard of the Romans Road? Right? You got a couple of head nods at least, right? There was a time when handing out tracts, basically small pamphlets, was the thing to do for Christians, right? For some churches. You, just got, you always had one kind of in your back pocket, probably four or five, maybe ten. You just kind of laying it down on the, at the restaurant table or handing it to the person at the library. Well, one of them is called the Romans Road. These tracts are a means for a person to share the gospel. Now, I've personally never handed out a, a tract, but I do appreciate the heart behind the method. The Romans Road specifically picks passages from the book of Romans that share the path of salvation. Here, here's the Romans Road, and as I share it, think about the mercy of God. The mercy of God that we read about in Romans 12, verses 1. 
Romans 3, verse 23. This is the first step on the Romans road. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's like, all right, we're there. We're in the door. We're on the road. You are a sinner. There's no other way to say it. A lot of churches don't say the word sin anymore. It's all, it's all over Scripture. You're a sinner. Sorry, not, not sorry. True, you're a sinner. And sin is what separates a person before a holy and just God. Because of sin, a relationship with God has been broken. If you do not believe you are a sinner, your path on the Romans road stops right there. You will know nothing about the mercy of God spoken about in Romans 12.1 if you do not understand that you are a sinner. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of life is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So, ah, step two, right? So there is a way to be reconciled to God. Yes, you are a rebellious sinner, but God has made a way for you to be reconciled to him. So let's hear more. Romans 5.8, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, God's love was demonstrated through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ. Some may object and say that Christ dying on a cross is an odd way for God to show his love. But if my previous points are true, then it should have been you on the cross. Now, the question is, how do you tap into this love? Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, then I'm going to tack on verse 13. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses, you say something, and you're saved. And then verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, so far, the Romans road, straight gospel. Good news, really good news. When a person is confronted with the truth of the gospel, it's like being whacked in a good way in the head with a two-by-four, right? In the best possible sense. <laughs> or, let's use this metaphor, I remember when I saw the ocean for the first time, um, physically with my own eyes, and I ran in, mouth wide open, I was confronted with all that salt. <laughs> There's no way around it. You can't help but notice what is going on. So God has made a way for his people to be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. God's people deserve wrath, but in his mercy now have peace. Let's go back several chapters to Romans 5.1. Here's the next step on the Romans road. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. If you have been justified by faith, you have a peace given to you by God that the world cannot offer you. And now one more, Romans 8.1. There's therefore now in this moment as you sit, Christian, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Romans road kind of comes full circle. The Romans road begins by making clear that you are a sinner. The Romans road begins by making clear that sin needs to be dealt with. Christ, the Son of God, dealt with your sin at the cross. He's our sinless Savior. And now, because of Christ, you are forgiven, and your sin no longer condemns you. You are forgiven and free because of Christ. The relationship between you and God is restored. And I could continue to take you down the Romans road to show you how God's mercy has been made evident through Christ. When you come to the end of chapter 11 of the book of Romans, we end up seeing and understanding that the Romans road isn't actually about you. <laughs> it is about Christ. It is about Christ receiving all the glory for what he has done in your life. Right before we turn the page to Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, we read these verses. For from him 
and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Everything points to Christ. Everything. It doesn't point back in on Sean Powers. It points to Jesus. Just think about, think about what we just talked about here. What it means for me or you to be reconciled to God on this Romans road. And then we get to the end of chapter 11. And it's all about Christ receiving the glory for what God has done in your life. If you're a Christian, the question at hand now is, what are you going to do? How will you respond? How will you respond to the mercy of Christ that has been poured out upon your life as if you were sitting in front of the Hoover Dam and the dam bust right wide open? That's how the mercy of Christ is in your life. How are you going to respond? We worship. <laughs> right? We worship. We worship because we are a people who know that we deserve the judgment and wrath of God. But out of love, God sent his one and only son to take on the judgment and wrath of God that we deserve. A great exchange has taken place. I think I've shared this story before. A while back, and I was grabbing a cup of coffee at a local cafe here in town, Waukee. And uh, the pleasantries are always taking place. The people were friendly. And this is a common response when someone asks me, hey, how you doing? Oftentimes I say, I'm better than I deserve. And this particular barista was like, surely you deserve better. And uh, I, that's a common response that I get from some people. And I didn't want to argue her point at the time, just not, con you know, I want to be polite. But if I were to respond, I would take her down part of the Romans road. And I don't need a track to do that. I would tell her, I am a sinner. I'm a wretched sinner. He needs God's grace and mercy. I deserve nothing. I deserve judgment. That's what I deserve. But God is rich in mercy, right? The Romans road helps us to see the why of worship. But the how is also important. Here's all of verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, here's part of the how, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That word bodies there is, you know, soma in the Greek, which means all of you, right? Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What we do not read in Romans 12.1 is that spiritual worship includes singing the top 10 Christian songs. Singing songs is a manifestation of, of spiritual worship, but Paul actually digs a little deeper. I mean, there's a reason why when we talk about worship here at Redemption Hill Church, we're not just talking about what comes out of our mouths when the music's played. We do not read that your spiritual act of worship is showing up to church on Sunday morning to listen to a sermon, right? Hearing and receiving the preached word of, of God can be a manifestation of worship, but sometimes people come to church with no intention of worship, Right? The Apostle Paul is saying that the way in which you worship God is living a sacrificial life. I think the Apostle Paul knew the connection he was making when he used the word sacrifice here. Same word gets used in connection to Christ. Jesus sacrificed his life so that his people could live. And by living, we are to commit daily acts of sacrifice. Acceptable worship to God is a sacrificial life. Speaking in the negative, verse 2 gives us additional insight about what it looks like to worship God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, it's easy to hear the warning in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, right? A lot of empty worship takes place because people are conformed to the world and not conformed to Christ. Do 
do not be conformed to this world. Christians are called by God to love people in the world, but we're not to be conformed to the world. There is an alluring, alluring effect about the ideas that permeate our culture. There are things in our culture that lure Christians away from conformity to Christ. When a poor person is lured away from conformity to Christ, then something or someone else is going to be worshipped. We see the same principle in the letter to the Colossians. Again, same author, the Apostle Paul. He says in, to this, in this letter, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world. And here's the key, and not according to Christ. Not according to Christ. So think of it this way. One way or another, your life is going to be shaped. One way or another, your life is going to be shaped. Your life is going to mirror what you value, what you believe, and who or what you worship. So we need to receive the admonition from God to not be conformed by this world. And thank the Lord that after this admonition, there's actually encouragement to allow yourself to go through the process of making sure your mind is transformed. When you are conformed to Christ and when your mind is transformed by Christ, you will see that the will of God is to live sacrificially, which again gets us right back into what it means to worship. Right? We conform our lives to Christ and then we live sacrificially just as Christ sacrificed himself. Uh, the Greek word for spiritual worship at the end of verse 1 is logikos. Um, it literally means that your worship of God is reasonable or rational. You are not to worship God flippantly or mindlessly, but worship is a matter of the heart and the mind. I'm going to allow two brilliant minds to speak of minds, not to, not to be redundant, but help, two brilliant minds helps us understand what it means to worship God. Again, this is John Stott, but then he's going to quote an ancient philosopher if rational, that's logikos, if rational is correct, then it is the worship offered by mind and heart, spiritual as opposed to ceremonial, an act of intelligent worship in which our minds are fully engaged. Several commentators illustrate this by a delightful quotation from Epictetus, the first century Stoic philosopher. This is what Epictetus says. If I were a nightingale, I would do what is proper to a nightingale. If I were a swan, what is proper to a swan? In fact, I am logikos, rational being, so I must praise God. You were designed for worship. You were designed to praise God. When you are discovered by God, you see the beauty of these deep truths. You see that all of your life is for Christ and you will undergo a transformation of the mind that leads you down a path of worship. So that's the why we worship, the how we worship. Now what's the goal of worship? I suppose there could be several answers to that question, the goal. Let's start with this. As you worship God, you glorify God. Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who is called by, night, by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You are created. You are a created human being made by God. Worship is a part of your DNA. And you are made to glorify God by living a lifestyle that is worshipful, a lifestyle of worship. Right around these doors, there's a, there's a banner that we hang up every Sunday. It says, for the glory of God, right? Around four years ago, after we planted, we got those banners. The banner was made with purpose to communicate a message. We exist to glorify God by worshiping him every single day. What is the glory of God? 
I think that's one of those terms where it's like, what does that even mean to glorify God? What are we talking about here? I found this quote helpful. Uh, the glory of God is the magnificence, worth, loveliness, and grandeur of God's many perfections, which he displays in his creative and redemptive acts in order to make his glory known to those in his presence. So we, the church, exist to make God's glory known here on earth by worshiping, by worshiping him. But even more to the point, our worship of God just does not just take place on Sunday morning. You need to take the message of the banner home with you. You need to take the message of the banner to your workplace. You need to take the message of the banner, kids, when you go to school. You take the message of the banner to the grocery store, wherever you go. You live this lifestyle of worship, which brings glory to God. So, in closing, I hope you see a little bit from Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, why we worship God, how we worship God, and the goal of worship. The why is the Romans road. The how is to conform to Christ by living sacrificially and ensuring our mind is transformed by the gospel. And the goal of worship is to give God all the glory for what he has done. Amen. Let's pray. You're listening to an audio resource from Redemption Hill Church. This resource is not meant to be a replacement for participation at a local church, but an accessory to the care you're receiving from your own pastors. To learn more about Redemption Hill Church or to give to our ministry, visit redemptionhilldsm.org.